We're here at World Time Attack 2017 and year after year we're seeing the power figures from the Pro Class cars skyrocket. We're getting to the point now where it's hard, if not impossible, to maintain reliability out of a factory engine. So this year in particular we're seeing a lot of the competitors, competitors move to a billet block. This replaces the factory block with billet aluminium and it's a lot stronger. We're here with Oscar from Elmer Racing all the way from Finland and Elmer Racing are responsible for the billet block behind me that they've designed specifically for the Pro Class Porsche RP968. I wanted to get a chance to talk to Oscar about the design process of this block and find out what exactly makes it tick. So Oscar, first of all, when you're faced with a factory engine block and you're looking at producing a billet item, what's the process that you go through? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, we obviously want to improve on the stock item because there's no point in just making a uh, replica of it. But I mean, we want to run the, as much stock accessories as possible and have it um, bolt in compatible as far as possible. So we um, take it into our, our uh, CNC machine, put in a probe tool there and probe all the, all the locations of the bolt holes, get all the angles correctly and all the sizes um, as close as possible. I mean, there is sometimes some guesswork because the factory tolerances are, are plus and minus something. So we try to get those correct. And yeah, then we start looking at, at what sort of things can we improve on the things like like how, how far can we push the bore on the cylinders and and what sort of a stroke area we're we looking at and how much clearance do we actually need for the crankshaft so we can uh, push that dimensions closer to get the block stiffer and what sort of a stiffening ribs can we do and how much weight can we pull out of different locations and, and all these kinds of things. And then it's also obviously a big question like are we only doing a block that needs to be fully compatible with a stock head and a stock girdle or if we're doing a stock head also then that opens up the design box quite a lot because then we can design the cooling system to be uh, much more efficient and remove some of the possibilities for vapor pockets on those and and really push the bore and clamping and yeah it, it opens up a lot. Let's just step back a, a, a yep. few notches here and, and I want to talk about uh, the bore size. So. What you're talking about here is the ability with a, a billet block, uh, you're not restrained by the factory bore diameter. Uh, obviously with a factory bore diameter uh, there's a thickness of the material in the sleeve or in the bore and if we go too big in the bore diameter it's reducing that. So if you're faced with a block where there's enough room then you can put in sleeves that are much larger in diameter, that's what you're talking about there to increase the capacity of the engine? Um, yeah, this um, this uh, 968 um, loosely based on a 968 engine is a really good example. I mean, it has uh, stock cooling ducting between the uh, bores. I mean, that's a good solution at the time, I guess. But with the materials now, it isn't really needed. So um, we could uh, push out the bore on those. I think it's a 12 millimeter larger bore than stock. So I mean, if you bored it out that much, there wouldn't be any cylinder liners at all left in the stock one. So, um, no, what's that's that really take your capacity to from stock into what you've produced? Um, I think it's uh, stock uh, 2.8 or 3 liter or something like that. We push this out to 4 liters now, and we uh, increase the stroke uh, a little bit to 94 millimeters. I was trying to push for a longer stroke, but the team didn't want a longer stroke. So, and they're the bosses, obviously. So we're, yeah, we went with the 94 millimeter stroke on that. So four liters, that's a, a fairly seriously large four-cylinder engine. Uh, what sort of uh, power do you expect from this, this billet engine? Um, well, design, design rating for that for circuit racing, uh, 1,500 horsepower. That's basically what I've uh, looked at, all the cylinder pressures. It needs to be able to, to clamp that much and, and all the cooling capacities and uh, crankshaft strengths and everything is, is rated for that. And what sort of RPM can you run it to? Um, the team here wanted to run it at 8,500, it's definitely capable of that. They ran it to uh, 7,000 plus RPM at the dyno already. Um, but yeah, I would, I, I would really want to see it go to 10,000 RPM because that's, that's the area I think it should be capable of. Now in terms of the strength advantage from the billet material, we've talked there about the design freedom to be able to increase the bore diameter, uh, but the other aspect that's obviously important is the, the strength advantage uh, and there's a little bit of debate there about the strength of a, a billet aluminium versus uh, for example uh, cast iron. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about your experience there and how you see that? Yeah I think um, it's, uh, well there's a, a two part question like 
just using a billet thing that that I mean reduces your your cost and the manufacturing amount and but there's also the um, alloy question like what alloy you're using and the billet alloys are uh, stronger than the cast materials because uh, you can't really cast all the aluminum alloys and the really strong aluminum alloys aren't castable at all and the material we use is I mean typically you see um, six, uh, 6061 or, or 6082 uh, aluminum materials used and that's probably most uh, good for most uses and it keeps the cost down but uh, we use a stronger material than that it's uh, a little bit stronger than 7075 is a little bit improvement on that alloy so the strength of the material is a little bit uh, over or around twice the strength of the typical blocks that, that, that they use so it is overkill but then again we, we want to overkill as much as possible to give a much more headroom on everything the other aspect there is there a, uh, a benefit from a, the grain structure that you get with using a billet versus a cast material? Um, it depends on the casting. There are some really, really nice um, uh, casting techniques now that that should produce quite, quite uniform um, structures in the casting. I mean, I mean, I'm not a casting expert, so so not that good at it. But I mean, have studied a little bit. So I mean. Um, you can get good, at, but especially when you start getting into the thinner wall thicknesses, then you start having problems with the casting process. I mean, if, even if you can get it cast correctly, then the grain structure is going to be different. And with strengthening ribs and all these kinds of structures, then you start running into problems. Now, obviously, with the strength, that's being one major issue, particularly when we are talking about an engine that's designed to be reliable at 1500 horsepower and potentially, as you say, maybe up to 10,000 RPM. Uh, but the other issue, particularly for a circuit application, is that weight is really, really critical. Uh, the aluminium that you're using for the, the billet, obviously, is, is a light material as it is. But uh, what are the other advantages from using a billet material and manufacturing the block in that way uh, in terms of weight savings? Um, well, it's uh, the sort of quantity-wise. I mean, you, you can tailor it for, for engine. I mean, if you need a, a space somewhere for some auxiliary, you can you can do that, and you can do the single a one-off version of that. And you can I mean, it's it's so easy to optimize. It, it needs a lot of design time, and uh, the manufacturing time also goes up quite a lot. I mean, in, in this engine, probably the engine block alone, uh, removing the last two or three kilos from that, probably doubles the machining time on that. So. So it is a trade-off, but then again, you can optimize it so far that it's, I mean, it's very good. We, we pulled, uh, I mean, a stock, uh, compared to a stock 968 engine, it has already aluminum um, block and is very well designed by Porsche to be lightweight. But we managed to pull a couple of kilos out of the block also. And from the cylinder head, uh, uh, pulled uh, close to four kilos out of the crankshaft also and everything. So, so I mean... Yeah, design-wise, and when you can actually count on the material actual being up to spec, that you don't have to take this casting process into account, and you have some tolerances there, there, so it, it helps out a lot with the design. Now, you've also built the crankshaft in this engine as well yourself? Uh, yeah, we did uh, the complete design on that and manufacturing in-house also for the crankshaft. So what, uh, what design functions have you put into that crankshaft uh, that to improve over the, the standard 968 crank? Obviously we've already talked about uh, the increased stroke, but is there anything else that sort of improves the, the crank over the Porsche design? Um, well, we have the um, oil cooling for the, or the ducting for the connecting rods are, are improved on that. And uh, design-wise also, I mean, the, uh, how can I explain, the, the connecting pieces between the connecting rod bearings and the main bearings uh, the shape of those are incredibly critical to get the the um, lo the sort of load um, the maximum load areas as low as possible, and they're very very sensitive. I mean, a small millimeter change in the shape of the of the uh, the sort of structural piece there will will alter alter the sort of max load area. So so we're able to push that down quite a bit and and have really a, a quite big safety margin on, even at these power levels. So how, how are you validating these designs both for the block and the, the crankshaft? You've just talked about uh, the design changes there in the crankshaft. How are you actually validating this? Uh, it's with a, a FEM model. Uh, basically the cooling stuff uh, you can't do with the FEM model. You, you would have to have a coupled CFD model to, to run that. So that's uh, a little bit overkill. I mean, it's when you run into problems then you need to do that because you need to figure out what's, what's wrong. But so far we haven't run into any problems. We have a um, custom solution for the cooling that we, we use. We, for instance, don't, don't have a, a sort of a, a solid top part of the block that, that a lot of the uh, billet manufacturers want to use. And that helps out a lot with the design of the cooling system and everything. But 
but so are you talking there about uh, an open deck design um it, it's sort of um it's not a closed deck design but it's not really an open deck design either we have sort of strengthening part in the cooling ducts that have a particular shape to still have the cooling be very efficient and uh, so far what we've been testing in a couple of engines it's it's works very good so happy with that. So essentially through the design process and then your validation on FEA you can essentially be reasonably confident when the engine goes into production that it is going to meet your design aims? Oh uh, yeah yeah I mean it, it is uh, it is guessing but it's like a scientific guess so it's like a, a little bit better than just guessing. <laughs> It takes a little bit more uh, smarts than just guessing to get that right. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about here is the uh, the way the head is retained onto the engine block. I mean, with a high boost turbocharged engine, we see this particularly in uh, drag racing where we're running very high boost pressures. It becomes the, the limiting factor, that head gasket integrity. And uh, when we're running very high boost pressures, very high cylinder pressures, mm -hmm. uh, the head and blocks both tend to flex and doesn't take much movement before that uh, head gasket seal is uh, is interrupted and it loses all the combustion pressure into the cooling system. Uh, is there anything special you've done here with the RP968 block design to help improve the head gasket sealing? Um, there is um, some some design changes we did. I mean, that's one of the things that you, that you really need to focus on when you do the do the design to make that work because you have to have a quite uniform uh, pressure across the the surfaces that you really need to seal. I mean, around the cylinder bores basically, and you don't want much pressure around the other areas because that's taking away from your clamping pressure at the cylinder. So that's very important. And uh, spent quite a lot of time doing design work on that. But it's not like anything special on that. We run a, a plain MLS gasket with no rings or anything in that and, and that, that is, is pretty much okay but you really need to pay attention to the, to the location of the bolts and uh, how the clamping areas are and, and you need to do a, 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 a what is it called a, a friction, friction clamping model on the FEM calculations to get that correctly and you, you, you need to know what you're doing with that to get, to get it to work but there is, I'm not sure if we can show this or not there is, uh, for instance, this cut here. That's is to to distribute the clamping forces more evenly for the for the bolts because they're solid material in between. So that will tend to get a, a sort of pressure spike on the clamping force where you don't want it. So then you need to to loosen up the material there to move the clamping pressure over to where you need it to be. So again, this is uh, something you've developed through FEA analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now with the, the sleeves that you're actually running in here, just uh, again related to that head gasket seal, uh, do you run a protrusion on the sleeves into the block to help with the, the sealing? Uh, we run it at, at pretty much zero height but, but the tolerance is on the plus side so it's, um, the tolerance is on the plus side and the negative side is, is completely flush so there is like a slight protrusion but depending on the teams I'm not even sure if they've decked this or not but, but um, yeah there is um, like a really tiny protrusion on, uh, on average. Now moving on to the cylinder head, you've also designed that from scratch again, it's billet and uh, with the, the freedom there to design the head essentially any way you want, uh, what have you done there to optimise the, the port flow? Um, well the biggest changes to the head in the hole, I mean we've flipped around the intake and exhaust side to better to better to suit the engine bay layout to have more space for the turbocharging accessories. Uh, but the uh, port shapes really, I mean it, um, they did uh, do a, a flow test on the head at, at Rams uh, head and they did get, did get very good numbers on that but it's not really something we designed for it's the uh, sort of cross-section change in the port and in the intake ducting and, and the same on the exhaust side also that's the most important for for engine performance because that's going to affect the the pulsation that you get and how you can tune for that for the um, valve opening timings and the length and, and diameters and and that's really what, what we mostly tune for and obviously fitting the largest valves possible so that you can yeah, run as high as RPM as possible and get more power out of the, out of the engine. Okay, now we've talked about the, the power aims there for circuit racing but you've also got some pretty high power aspirations for the engine uh, if it was to be used in a drag application. Can you tell us what you think the billet engine may be capable of in drag applications? Yeah, we've uh, had a couple of uh, drag racing guys ask, ask questions about that and, and I haven't really done any calculations of that but I've told them that I would be very dis disappointed if it wasn't producing, if it wasn't capable of producing over 3,000 horsepower. And that would basically mean uh, 10,000, maybe 10,500 RPM and yeah, really raise the boost pressure up to, I think it would need uh, around uh, 5 or 6 bar boost or something like that to, to, to yeah, make the 3,000. 
So fairly safe to say you're never going to be running 3,000 plus horsepower out of a factory 968 engine? <laughs> yeah, I think not. Uh, the entire package that you've got here, uh, what's it actually weigh, just to put some perspective in, into things? Uh, yeah, that's uh, actually yeah, excellent question. That's one of the main things we actually aimed for this with. With I mean, you can have a 1,500 horsepower engine, it's not that, that I mean, special nowadays. I mean, there are lots of engines producing that amount. But what we really focused on was get, to get the weight very low on this. So the engine package uh, without the exhaust manifold and intake manifold, uh, including the oil pump, is around 106 kilograms. I don't have the, the weight for all the pieces, but uh, somewhere around there. It's incredibly light for an engine that can produce uh, that sort of power. Uh, the other thing that I'm interested in there for a circuit racing application, uh, what sort of uh, sort of kilometre usage would you expect between uh, overhauls or maintenance? Um, on, on this particular engine, it's very short because we're running drag racing connecting rods on those. So it's it's basically um, here. It, here the plan was that they would change the connecting rods over for Saturday. And we've designed the engine actually, we have a O-ring ceiling so there's um, no need to wait for silicone to, to harden or anything and we have a O-ring ceiling on, uh, bottom on the, on the girdle also. So it's possible with, you don't need to remove the block from the engine to get the pistons and connecting rods out and it's quick to put the cylinder head back, back on and everything. So when you say drag racing conrods you're talking, I'm assuming they're about aluminium conrods. Yep. So those fatigue and they, they need to be replaced fairly regularly is what you're sort of talking about there. Uh, yeah, and especially uh, they have a really, really sm uh, small, small end, so I'm guessing that that's one of the limitations. I haven't tested them myself, so I'm not really sure, but that's one of the things we're looking at, maybe making our own custom connecting rods to, to get a little bit more, more lifetime out of those, but we'll have to see when we start testing them ourselves in, in December-ish, maybe. All right, look, Oscar, it's, uh, it's an absolute work of art, and I uh, really uh, enjoyed finding out a little bit more about the engine. Thanks for uh, giving us some insight into that. Uh, if anyone wants to find out more about your company, how can they do that? Uh, well, we have our website, elmerracing.com, and I think uh, most up-to-date stuff is probably on our Facebook page. You can find us there at, uh, I think it's elmerracing.com, actually, I think is the Facebook page, and we have YouTube videos also, and uh, Twitter feed also, and yeah, it should be quite reachable, I hope. Perfect. Well, we uh, look forward to seeing how the engine works out in performance. Thanks for the chat. <laughs> Thanks very much. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson. You'll learn about performance engine building and EFI tuning, and you'll also have the chance to ask questions which I'll be answering live. Remember, it's 100% free, so follow the link to claim your spot.